This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anti Federalist Papers. Anti Federalist No. 5. Federal Farmer. Letter No. 3. Letters from the Federal Farmer to the Republican. October 10, 1787. Dear Sir, the great object of a free people must be so to form their government and laws, and so to administer them, as to create a confidence in and respect for the laws, and thereby induce the sensible and virtuous part of the community to declare in favor of the laws, and to support them without an expensive military force. I wish, though I confess I have not much hope, that this may be the case with the laws of Congress under the new Constitution. I am fully convinced that we must organize the national government on different principles, and make the parts of it more efficient, and secure in it more effectually the different interests in the community, or else leave in the state government some powers proposed to be lodged in it, at least till such an organization shall be found to be practicable. Not sanguine in my expectations of a good federal administration, and satisfied, as I am, of the impracticability of consolidating the states, and at the same time of preserving the rights of the people at large, I believe we still ought to leave some of those powers in the state governments, in which the people, in fact, will still be represented, to define some other powers proposed to be vested in the general government, more carefully, and to establish a few principles to secure a proper exercise of the powers given it. It is not my object to multiply objections, or to contend about inconsiderable powers or amendments. I wish the system adopted with a few alterations, but those, in my mind, are essential ones. If adopted without, every good citizen will acquiesce, though I shall consider the duration of our governments, and the liberties of this people, very much dependent on the administration of the general government. A wise and honest administration may make the people happy under any government, but necessity only can justify even our leaving open avenues to the abuse of power by wicked, unthinking, or ambitious men. I will examine first the organization of the proposed government, in order to judge, second, with propriety what powers are improperly, at least prematurely, lodged in it. I shall examine, thirdly, the undefined powers, and fourthly, those powers, the exercise of which is not secured on safe and proper ground. First, as to the organization, the House of Representatives, the Democratic branch, as it is called, is to consist of sixty-five members, that is, about one representative for fifty thousand inhabitants, to be chosen biennially. The federal legislature may increase this number to one for each thirty thousand inhabitants, abating fractional numbers in each state. Thirty-three representatives will make a quorum for doing business, and a majority of those present determine the sense of the House. I have no idea that the interests, feelings, and opinions of three or four millions of people, especially touching internal taxation, can be collected in such a house. In the nature of things, nine times ten men of the elevated classes in the community only can be chosen. Connecticut, for instance, will have five representatives, not one man in a hundred of those who form the Democratic branch in the state legislature will, on a fair computation, be one of the five. The people of this country, in one sense, may all be democratic, but if we make the proper distinction between the few men of wealth and abilities, and consider them, as we ought, as the natural aristocracy of the country, and the great body of the people, the middle and lower classes, as the democracy, this federal representative branch will have but very little democracy in it. Even this small representation is not secured on proper principles. The branches of the legislature are essential parts of the fundamental compact, and ought to be so fixed by the people that the legislature cannot alter itself by modifying the elections of its own members. This, by a part of Article I, Section 4, the general legislature may do. It may evidently so regulate elections as to secure the choice of any particular description of men. It may make the whole state one district, make the capital or any places in the state the place or places of election. It may declare that the five men, or whatever the number may be the state may choose, 
who shall have the most votes shall be considered as chosen in this case it is easy to perceive how the people who live scattered in the inland towns will bestow their votes on different men and how a few men in a city in any order or profession may unite and place any five men they please highest among those that may be voted for and all this may be done constitutionally and by those silent operations which are not immediately perceived by the people in general i know it is urged that the general legislature will be disposed to regulate elections on fair and just principles this may be true good men will generally govern well with almost any constitution but why, in laying the foundation of the social system, need we unnecessarily leave a door open to improper regulations? This is a very general and unguarded clause, and many evils may flow from that part which authorizes the Congress to regulate elections. Were it omitted, the regulations of elections would be solely in the respective states, where the people are substantially represented, and where the elections ought to be regulated, otherwise to secure a representation from all parts of the community in making the Constitution, we ought to provide for dividing each state into a proper number of districts, and for confining the electors in each district to the choice of some men who shall have a permanent interest and residence in it, and also for this essential object, that the representative elected shall have a majority of the votes of those electors who shall attend and give their votes." in considering the practicability of having a full and equal representation of the people from all parts of the union not only distances and different opinions customs and views common in extensive tracts of country are to be taken into view but many differences peculiar to eastern middle and southern states these differences are not so perceivable among the members of congress and men of general information in the states as among the men who would properly form the democratic branch the eastern states are very democratic, and composed chiefly of moderate freeholders. They have but few rich men and no slaves. The southern states are composed chiefly of rich planters and slaves. They have but few moderate freeholders, and the prevailing influence in them is generally a dissipated aristocracy. The middle states partake partly of the eastern and partly of the southern character. Perhaps nothing could be more disjointed, unwieldy, and incompetent to doing business with harmony and dispatch than a federal house of representatives properly numerous for the great objects of taxation, etc., collected from the several states. Whether such men would ever act in concert, whether they would not worry along a few years and then be the means of separating the parts of the Union, is very problematical. View this system in whatever form we can, propriety brings us still to this point, a federal government possessed of general and complete powers as to those national objects which cannot well come under the cognizance of the internal laws of the respective states and this federal government accordingly consisting of branches not very numerous the house of representatives is on the plan of consolidation but the senate is entirely on the federal plan and delaware will have as much constitutional influence in the senate as the largest state in the union and in this Senate are lodged legislative, executive, and judicial powers. Ten states in this Union urge that they are small states, nine of which were present in the Convention. They were interested in collecting large powers into the hands of the Senate, in which each state will have its equal share of power. I suppose it was impracticable for the three large states, as they were called, to get the Senate formed on any other principles but this only proves that we cannot form one general government on equal and just principles and proves that we ought not to lodge in it such extensive powers before we are convinced of the practicability of organizing it on just and equal principles the senate will consist of two members from each state chosen by the state legislatures every sixth year the clause referred to respecting the elections of representatives empowers the general legislature to regulate the elections of senators also except as to the places of choosing senators there is therefore but little more security in the elections than in those of representatives fourteen senators make a quorum for business and a majority of the senators present give the votes of the senate except in giving judgment upon an impeachment or in making treaties or in expelling a member, when two-thirds of the senators present must agree. The members of the legislature are not excluded from being elected to any military offices or any civil offices except those created or the emoluments of which shall be increased by themselves. 
two-thirds of the members present of either house may expel a member at pleasure the senate is an independent branch of the legislature a court for trying impeachments and also a part of the executive having a negative in the making of all treaties and in appointing almost all officers the vice president is not a very important if not an unnecessary part of the system he may be a part of the senate at one period and act as the supreme executive magistrate at another the election of this officer, as well as of the President of the United States, seems to be properly secured. But when we examine the powers of the President and the forms of the Executive, we shall perceive that the general government in this part will have a strong tendency to aristocracy or the government of the few. The Executive is, in fact, the President and the Senate in all transactions of any importance. The President is connected with or tied to the Senate. He may always act with the Senate, but never can effectually counteract its views. The President can appoint no officer, civil or military, who shall not be agreeable to the Senate, and the presumption is that the will of so important a body will not be very easily controlled, and that it will exercise its powers with great address. In the judicial department, powers ever kept distinct in well-balanced governments are no less improperly blended in the hands of the same men in the judges of the supreme court is lodged the law the equity and the fact it is not necessary to pursue the minute organical parts of the general government proposed there were various interests in the convention to be reconciled especially of large and small states of carrying and non-carrying states and of states more and states less democratic vast labor and attention were by the convention bestowed on the organization of the parts of the constitution offered Still, it is acknowledged there are many things radically wrong in the essential parts of this Constitution, but it is said that these are the result of our situation. On a full examination of the subject, I believe it, but what do the laborious inquiries and determinations of the Convention prove? If they prove anything, they prove that we cannot consolidate the States on proper principles. The organization of the government presented proves that we cannot form a general government in which all power can be safely lodged, and a little attention to the parts of the one proposed will make it appear very evident that all the powers proposed to be lodged in it will not be then well deposited, either for the purposes of government or the preservation of liberty. I will suppose no abuse of powers in those cases in which the abuse of it is not well guarded against. I will suppose the words authorizing the general government to regulate the elections of its own members struck out of the plan, or free district elections, in each state amply secured. That the small representation provided for shall be as fair and equal as it is capable of being made. I will suppose the judicial department regulated on pure principles by future laws, as far as it can be by the Constitution, and consistent with the situation of the country still there will be an unreasonable accumulation of powers in the general government and if all be granted enumerated in the plan proposed the plan does not present a well-balanced government the senatorial branch of the legislative and the executive are substantially united and the president or the first executive magistrate may aid the senatorial interest when weakest but never can effectually support the democratic however it may be oppressed the excellency, in my mind, of a well-balanced government is that it consists of nine distinct branches, each sufficiently strong and independent to keep its own station, and to aid either of the other branches which may occasionally want aid. The convention found that any but a small house of representatives would be expensive, and that it would be impracticable to assemble a large number of representatives. Not only the determination of the convention in this case, but the situation of the states proves the impracticability of collecting, in any one point, a proper representation. The formation of the Senate and the smallness of the House being therefore the result of our situation and the actual state of things, the evils which may attend the exercise of many powers in this national government may be considered as without remedy. All officers are impeachable before the Senate only before the men by whom they are appointed, or who are consenting to the appointment of these officers. No judgment of conviction on an impeachment can be given unless two-thirds of the senators agree. Under these circumstances the right of impeachment in the House can be but of little importance. The House cannot expect often to convict the offender, and therefore, probably, 
will but seldom or never exercise the right. In addition to the insecurity and inconveniences attending this organization before mentioned, it may be observed that it is extremely difficult to secure the people against the fatal effects of corruption and influence. The power of making any law will be in the President, eight senators, and seventeen representatives relative to the important objects enumerated in the, con in the Constitution. Where there is a small representation, a sufficient number to carry any measure may, with ease, be influenced by bribes, offices, and civilities. They may easily form private junctos and outdoor meetings, agree on measures, and carry them by silent votes. Impressed as I am with a sense of the difficulties there are in the way of forming the parts of a federal government on proper principles, and seeing a government so unsubstantially organized after so arduous an attempt has been made, I am led to believe that powers ought to be given to it with great care and caution. In the second place it is necessary, therefore, to examine the extent and the probable operations of some of those extensive powers proposed to be vested in this government. These powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, respect internal as well as external objects. Those respecting external objects, as all foreign concerns, commerce, imposts, all causes arising on the seas, peace and war, and Indian affairs, can be lodged nowhere else with any propriety but in this government. Many powers that respect internal objects ought clearly to be lodged in it, as those to regulate trade between the states, weights and measures, the coin, or current monies, post offices, naturalization, etc., these powers may be exercised without essentially affecting the internal police of the respective states. But powers to lay and collect internal taxes, to form the militia, to make bankrupt laws, and to decide on appeals, questions arising on the internal laws of the respective states, are of a very serious nature, and carry with them almost all other powers. These taken in connection with the others, and powers to raise armies and build navies, proposed to be lodged in this government, appear to me to comprehend all the essential powers in the community, and those which will be left to the states will be of no great importance. A power to lay and collect taxes at discretion is, in itself, of very great importance. By means of taxes, the government may command the whole or any part of the subject's property. Taxes may be of various kinds, but there is a strong distinction between external and internal taxes. External taxes are impost duties, which are laid on imported goods. They may usually be collected in a few seaport towns and of a few individuals, though ultimately paid by the consumer. A few officers can collect them, and they can be carried no higher than trade will bear or smuggling permit. That in the very nature of commerce, bounds are set to them. But internal taxes, as poll and land taxes, excises, duties on all written instruments, etc., may fix themselves on every person and species of property in the community. They may be carried to any lengths, and in proportion as they are extended, numerous officers must be employed to assess them and to enforce the collection of them. In the United Netherlands, the general government has complete powers as to external taxation, but as to internal taxes, it makes requisitions on the provinces. Internal taxation in this country is more important, as the country is so very extensive. As many assessors and collectors of federal taxes will be above 300 miles from the seat of the federal government as will be less. Besides, to lay and collect internal taxes in this extensive country must require a great number of congressional ordinances immediately operating upon the body of the people. These must continually interfere with the state laws and thereby produce disorder and general satisfaction till the one system of laws or the other operating on the same subjects shall be abolished. These ordinances alone, to say nothing of those respecting the militia, coin, commerce, federal judiciary, etc., etc., will probably soon defeat the operations of the state laws and governments. Should the general government think it politic, as some administrations, if not all, probably will, to look for a support in a system of influence, the government will take every occasion to multiply laws and officers to execute them, considering these as so many necessary props for its own support. Should this system of policy be adopted, taxes more productive than the impost duties will probably be wanted to support the government, 
and to discharge foreign demands, without leaving anything for the domestic creditors. The internal sources of taxation then must be called into operation, and internal tax laws and federal assessors and collectors spread over this immense country. All these circumstances consider, is it wise, prudent, or safe to vest the powers of laying and collecting internal taxes in the general government, while imperfectly organized and inadequate, and to trust to amending it hereafter and making it adequate to this purpose? It is not only unsafe, but absurd to lodge power in a government before it is fitted to receive it. It is confessed that this power and representation ought to go together. Why give the power first? Why give the power to the few who, when possessed of it, may have address enough to prevent the increase of representation? Why not keep the power, and when necessary, amend the Constitution, and add to its other parts this power, and a proper increase of representation at the same time? Then men who may want the power will be under strong inducements to let in the people, by their representatives, into the government, to hold their due proportion of this power. If a proper representation be impracticable, then we shall see this power resting in the states, where it at present ought to be, and not inconsiderately given up. When I recollect how lately Congress, conventions, legislatures, and people contended in the cause of liberty, and carefully weighed the importance of taxation, I can scarcely believe we are serious in proposing to vest the powers of laying and collecting internal taxes in a government so imperfectly organized for such purposes. Should the United States be taxed by a House of Representatives of 200 members, which would be about 15 members for Connecticut, 25 for Massachusetts, etc., still the middle and lower classes of people would have no great share, in fact, in taxation. I am aware it is said that the representation proposed by the new Constitution is sufficiently numerous. It may be for many purposes, but to suppose that this branch is sufficiently numerous to guard the rights of the people in the administration of the government, in which the purse and sword is placed, seems to argue that we have forgot what the true meaning of representation is. I am sensible also that it is said that Congress will not attempt to lay and collect internal taxes, that it is necessary for them to have the power, though it cannot probably be exercised. I admit that it is not probable that any prudent Congress will attempt to lay and collect internal taxes, especially direct taxes, but this only proves that the power would be improperly lodged in Congress, and that it might be abused by imprudent and designing men. I have heard several gentlemen, to get rid of objections to this part of the Constitution, attempt to construe the powers relative to direct taxes as those who object to it would have them. As to these, it is said, that Congress will only have power to make requisitions, leaving it to the States to lay and collect them. I see but very little color for this construction, and the attempt only proves that this part of the plan cannot be defended. By this plan there can be no doubt, but that the powers of Congress will be complete, as to all kinds of taxes whatever. Further, as to internal taxes, the state governments will have concurrent powers with the general government, and both may tax the same objects in the same year. And the objection that the general government may suspend a state tax, as a necessary measure for the promoting the collection of a federal tax, is not without foundation. As the states owe large debts, and have large demands upon them individually, there clearly would be a propriety in leaving in their possession exclusively some of the internal sources of taxation, at least until the federal government shall be properly increased. The power in the general government to lay and collect internal taxes will render its powers respecting armies, navies, and the militia the more exceptionable. By the Constitution, it is proposed that Congress shall have the power to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years, to provide and maintain a navy, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, reserving to the states the right to appoint officers, and to train the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. Congress will have unlimited power to raise armies, and to engage officers and men for any number of years, but a legislative act applying the money for their support can have operation for no longer term than two years, and if a subsequent Congress do not within the two years renew the appropriation, or further appropriate monies for the use of the army, the army will be left to take care of itself. 
When an army shall once be raised for a number of years, it is not probable that it will find much difficulty in getting Congress to pass laws for applying monies to its support. I see so many men in America fond of a standing army, and especially among those who probably will have a large share in administering the federal system. It is very evident to me that we shall have a large standing army as soon as the monies to support them can possibly be found. An army is a very agreeable place of employment for the young gentlemen of many families. A power to raise armies must be lodged somewhere. Still, this will not justify the lodging this power in a bare majority of so few men without any checks, or in the government in which the great body of the people, in the nature of things, will be only nominally represented. In the state governments the great body of the people, the yeomanry, etc., of the country are represented. It is true that they will choose the members of Congress, and may now and then choose a man of their own way of thinking, but it is impossible for forty or thirty thousand people in this country, one time in ten, to find a man who can possess similar feelings, views, and interests with themselves. Powers to lay and collect taxes, and to raise armies, are of the greatest moment. For carrying them into effect, laws need not be frequently made, and the yeomanry, etc., of the country ought substantially to have a check upon the passing of these laws. This check ought to be placed in the legislature, or at least in the few men the common people of the country will probably have in Congress, in the true sense of this word, from among themselves. It is true the yeomanry of the country possess the lands, the weight of property, possess the arms, and are too strong a body of men to be openly offended and therefore, it is urged, they will take care of themselves, that men who shall govern will not dare to pay any disrespect to their opinions. It is easily perceived that if they have not their proper negative upon passing laws in Congress, or on the passage of laws relative to taxes and armies, they may in twenty or thirty years be by means imperceptible to them totally deprived of that boasted weight and strength. This may be done in a great measure by Congress, if disposed to do it, by modeling the militia. Should one-fifth or one-eighth part of the men capable of bearing arms be made a select militia, as has been proposed, and those the young and ardent part of the community, possessed of but little or no property, and all the others put upon a plan that will render them of no importance, the former will answer all the purposes of an army, while the latter will be defenseless. The State must train the militia in such form and according to such systems and rules as Congress shall prescribe, and the only actual influence the respective States will have respecting the militia will be in appointing the officers. I see no provision made for calling out the posse comitatus for executing the laws of the Union, but a provision is made for Congress to call forth the militia for the execution of them and the militia in general, or any select part of it, may be called out under military officers, instead of the sheriff, to enforce an execution of federal laws, in the first instance, and thereby introduce an entire military execution of the laws. I know that powers to raise taxes, to regulate the military strength of the community on some uniform plan, to provide for its defense and internal order, and for duly executing laws, must be lodged somewhere. But still we ought not so to lodge them as evidently to give one order of men in the community undue advantages over others or to commit the many to the mercy prudence and moderation of the few and so far as it may be necessary to lodge any of the peculiar powers in the general government a more safe exercise of them ought to be secured by requiring the consent of two-thirds or three-fourths of congress thereto until the federal representation can be increased so that the democratic members in congress may stand some tolerable chance of a reasonable negative in behalf of the numerous important and democratic part of the community i am not sufficiently acquainted with the laws and internal police of all the states to discern fully how general bankrupt laws made by the union would affect them or promote the public good i believe the property of debtors in the several states is held responsible for their debts in modes and forms very different if uniform, bank, if uniform bankrupt laws can be made without producing real and substantial inconveniences, I wish them to be made by Congress. There are some powers proposed to be lodged in the general government in the judicial department, I think very unnecessarily. I mean powers respecting questions arising upon the internal laws of the respective states. It is proper the federal judiciary should have the 
should have powers coextensive with the federal legislature, that is, the power of deciding finally on the laws of the Union. By Article Three, Section 2, the powers of the federal judiciary are extended, among other things, to all cases between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between a state or the citizens thereof, and foreign states, citizens, or subjects. Actions in all these cases, except against a state government, are now brought and finally determined in the law courts of the states respectively, and as there are no words to exclude these courts of their jurisdiction in these cases, they will have concurrent jurisdiction with the inferior federal courts in them, and therefore, if the new Constitution be adopted without any amendment in this respect, all those numerous actions now brought in the state courts between our citizens and foreigners, between citizens of different states, by state governments against foreigners, and by state governments against citizens of other states, may also be brought in the federal courts, and an appeal will lay in them from the state courts, or federal inferior courts, to the supreme judicial court of the nation. In almost all these cases, either party may have the trial by jury in the state courts, excepting paper money and tender laws, which are wisely guarded against in the proposed Constitution. Justice may be obtained in these courts on reasonable terms. They must be more competent to proper decisions in the laws of their respective states than the federal courts can possibly be. I do not, in any point of view, see the need of opening a new jurisdiction to these causes, of opening a new scene of expensive lawsuits, of suffering foreigners and citizens of different states to drag each other many hundred miles into the federal courts. It is true those courts may be so organized by a wise and prudent legislature as to make the obtaining of justice in them relatively easy. They may, in general, be organized on the common principles of the country, but this benefit is by no means secured by the Constitution. The trial by jury is secured only in those few criminal cases to which the federal laws will extend, as crimes committed on the seas, against the laws of nations, treason, and counterfeiting the federal securities and coin. But even in these cases the jury trial of the vicinage is not secured. Particularly in the large states, a citizen may be tried for a crime committed in the state, and yet tried in some states five hundred miles from the place where it was committed. But the jury trial is not secured at all in civil cases. Though the Convention have not established this trial, it is to be hoped that Congress, in putting the new system into execution, will do it by a legislative act, in all cases in which it can be done with propriety. Whether the jury trial is not excluded from the Supreme Judicial Court is an important question. By Article Three, Section 2, all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, and in those cases in which a state shall be the party, the Supreme Court shall have jurisdiction. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exception, and under such regulations, as the Congress shall make. By court is understood a court consisting of judges, and the idea of a jury is excluded. This court, or the judges, are to have jurisdiction on appeals, in all the cases enumerated, as to law and fact. The judges are to decide the law and try the fact, and the trial of the fact being assigned to the judges by the Constitution, a jury for trying the fact is excluded. However, under the exceptions and powers to make regulations, Congress may, perhaps, introduce the jury to try the fact in most necessary cases. There can be but one Supreme Court in which the final jurisdiction will center in all federal cases, except in cases where appeals by law shall not be allowed. The judicial powers of the federal courts extends in law and equity to certain cases, and therefore the powers to determine on the law in equity and as to the fact, all will consenter in the Supreme Court. These powers, which by this Constitution are blended in the same hands, the same judges, are in Great Britain deposited in different hands, to wit, the decision of the law in the law judges, the decision in equity in the chancellor, and the trial of the fact in the jury. It is a very dangerous thing to vest in the same judge power to decide on the law, and also general powers in equity. For if the law restrain him, he is only to step into his shoes of equity and give what judgment his reason or opinion may dictate. We have no precedents in this country, as yet, to regulate the divisions in equity as in Great Britain. Equity, therefore, in the Supreme Court for many years will be mere discretion. I confess in the Constitution of this Supreme Court, as left by the Constitution, I do not see a spark of freedom or a shadow of our own or the British common law. This Court is to have appellate jurisdiction in all the other cases before mentioned. Many sensible men suppose that cases before mentioned respect, as well as the criminal cases as the civil ones, mentioned antecedently in the Constitution, if so an appeal is allowed in criminal cases. 
contrary to the usual sense of the law. How far it may be proper to admit a foreigner or the citizen of another state to bring actions against state governments, which have failed in performing so many promises made during the war, is doubtful. How far it may be proper to so humble a state as to oblige it to answer an individual in a court of law, is worthy of consideration. The states are now subject to no such actions, and this new jurisdiction will subject the states and many defendants to actions and processes which were not in the contemplation of the parties when the contract was made. All engagements existing between citizens of different states, citizens and foreigners, states and foreigners, and states and citizens of other states were made, the parties contemplating the remedies then existing on the laws of the states and the new remedy proposed to be given in the federal courts can be founded on no principle whatever. Yours and etc. The Federal Farmer. End of Anti-Federalist. Number 5.